I'll give you a bit of background in case you haven't had it before. I so you all know that there's a conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change happening in Paris this November, right? And the acronym for that is COP, Conference of the Parties, and it's going to be COP21. I started working on climate change in COP6. So you can do the math for that. So I worked on the negotiations as an advocate, campaigner, I guess lobbyist as well, from COP6 to COP9. Um, that was the period which saw the Kyoto Protocol get put in place uh, just slightly before I started. I think that was COP5. Then they had to deal with all the tiny uh, and not so tiny technical details on how one gets the Kyoto Protocol off the ground, how one implements it, Bonn Annex, uh, and so forth. So that saw the introduction of these things that were known as the flexible mechanisms for basically achieving people's uh, different countries' obligations under the treaty in terms of reducing greenhouse gases. So the flexible mechanisms, or the flex mechs as people called it, were for some people a great market-based solution for dealing with climate change. For other people, they were a tremendous loophole which allowed the biggest uh, emitters of greenhouse gases to escape any form of structural change in terms of reshaping the energy mix, their economy, uh, the way in which money flowed towards these things. So I was one of the people who was criticizing some of the flexible mechanisms, uh, particularly the clean development mechanism, which was targeted at developing countries and offering a way to gain credit for doing certain projects that would, it was held, um, avoid more greenhouse gas emissions than would otherwise have been caused. So once you get into all these hypotheticals, it gets quite complicated and it also b opens up the opportunity to, um, how to say, play the system. Right? Um, the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, was one big loophole. The second one was in terms of forests and sinks, but I promise not to get too technical in this uh, discussion. The key thing to remember with all the climate politics is that there's no getting away from the technical issue. The, I'm assuming people here know, hi. I'm not even going, I'm not even going to go into climate science. I'm assuming people here can go find out yourselves if you're not clear about the climate science. I'm not going to go uh, very much at all into the history of the negotiations. I think you can find that all out. Um, how this all started in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit in Brazil. How the UNFCCC convention came out alongside with the Biodiversity Convention and the Convention on Desertification and Deforestation. Uh, but this is probably the most prominent one that survived because it dealt with a very timely and very prominent global issue. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the thing that brings down the Climate Change Convention is not any lack of environmental commitment on the part of the member states. That varies according to the state. The problem with climate change politically is that it's an entirely economic issue as far as the negotiators are concerned. So when the countries, the member states of the UN, which are party to this climate change convention, go and negotiate, they're not thinking about the environment so much, they're not thinking about 20 years, they're not thinking about two degrees, they're not thinking about 150 years. They're thinking about how do they avoid having to re-engineer their economies and their societies away from fossil fuels. Because ultimately, Fossil fuels are what are used to fuel the factories, to fuel industry, to fuel services, even agriculture. So that's why it's important to recognize climate change effectively as a proxy issue for economic uh, development, economic growth. And once you recognize that, it becomes easier to understand the different diplomatic positions of the countries. So you'll find that a uh, small island state like... Uh, you know, Vanuatu, without much industry, without a, I mean, they're still dependent on fossil fuels, but they're not 
It's hugely dependent on some other large industrial producer. And because of their immediate environmental geographical situation, are facing rising sea levels and uh, harsher storms and weather patterns, they will take a very progressive approach to climate change because it's right in their face. They don't have a lot. To, they have more to lose from climate change than they do from having to change their production system or their fuel system. Whereas a country like the United States, Australia, Japan, uh, the European Union, China even, although actually no, China's a special case. Those kind of countries, they have huge economies and their economies are hugely tied to fossil fuels. So shifting the basis on which their economy is powered is a very, very, very big political project and economic project. And not many of those are willing to take it on. And that's why the US set out the Kyoto Protocol. And because the US set out the Kyoto Protocol, because it's one of the world's largest emitters of greenhouse gases, the, there was a major political setback in achieving the global goals. And that's why you had things like the flexible mechanisms introduced. That's why there were many, many ways to squeeze around it. Uh, even though the US is one of the big promoters of that, it never, it never joined the agreement at the end of the day. Other countries that benefited from that were Russia as well. Um, and now we come to 2015. We come to the next round of commitments after the Kyoto Protocol has expired. And the question is, how do you get the US to participate? Well, the solution that's been found is to go by voluntary approach. So every country cooks up their own targets. And effectively, they remove any form of pressure set at an international level. Why does that matter? Because the wording of this convention means that there's a common but shared responsibility for dealing with climate change. So common means the whole world shares that responsibility. But because that responsibility is so-called differentiated, that means that each country has a responsibility to it, which is modified by their historical contribution. So countries like Britain and the US and so forth that fired up coal-fired power plants over 100 years ago for the Industrial Revolution and have been emitting large amounts of greenhouse gases through that process and deforestation share more historical responsibility than a uh, younger industrial country such as <coughs> Malaysia or Singapore, for example, or Thailand for that matter. So that's the common but differentiated responsibility. And there are, of course, more members, more countries in the United Nations that are less industrially advanced than there are the small group of OECD countries, right? the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the rich countries. So they're outnumbered, but they have a bigger responsibility under the convention. So if you don't want to meet your obligation and you are in a minority, then you try and get out of it or you try and find other ways to do it. So the US has recently concluded a deal with China and that's effectively set the tone for this. So end of short story, don't expect too much from COP21 in Paris. Don't expect too much in terms of binding global uh, agreements because one, they're very hard to achieve because of the economic issues that drive each country. And a lot of countries have to, they, you know, they can't simply agree everything at the negotiation table, uh, wherever the international summits meet, they have to go home and say that this is the deal we struck, can we accept this deal? They all have to fight with their domestic politics. And this is uh, probably most clearly illustrated in the case of the US, where President Obama and uh, before him, President Clinton, and then subsequently Bush, they have to deal with their Congress, their Senate, uh, checks and balances. Um, they don't necessarily have to deal with the public. So don't expect too much from COP21 because each country has to come up with its own target. What does that mean? It means that we may not have much chance in terms of smaller scale activism in dealing with what happens at COP21 and the outcomes. But that means more action happens at the national level. There's more to gain and more to see there. So there may not be much of a driving force um, through the United Nations, 
But the fact that every country has to come up with their own plan, however strong or weak that might be, effectively puts climate change on national agendas if it wasn't there before. So it's an opportunity, if you want to look at it very, very, very optimistically. Right? Now the question is, what can you make out of that opportunity? Well, let's look at Malaysia. So Malaysian policy has um, received some recent injections. There was the national climate change policy. Uh, this kind of came out of the 2010-2011. Uh, it came after the 2009 Copenhagen summit, which was one of the global uh, focus points. And the prime minister here at the uh, at the time was quite keen on making some kind of grand statement. He hadn't thought long and hard about climate change. He got on the plane, he went to Copenhagen, he wanted to announce something. So he, I, I know this is a fact because he literally went and got a back of the envelope calculation on a number that he could commit to in the canteen and he announced it there. And that was basically along the lines of reducing the greenhouse gas intensity of Malaysia's GDP by 30, 34? 40%, okay. 40% by a given year. And it's already be effectively going to be achieved by, I think, 2018 or something, right? Yeah. So it was an easy target because they calculate the math, basically, and they worked it back. And this is what we can do without doing too much. Um, but it sounded good. Right? It sounded good because at the time, nobody else had a target. So it looked like he was ahead of the curve. But having worked in um, government here and having worked in state government, I went for the ministry meetings on this. Uh, it started off fairly well, but then there was a problem. Who's in charge? Normally, you're dealing with the Natural Resources and Environment Ministry, okay, NRE. They're in charge of environment. They lead in negotiations. When you go in, uh, to the UN and you talk about anything to do with the UN triple C. But when you look at climate change, it covers a lot of issues, a lot of issues, health, economy, energy, environment, um, transport. And these are all ministries, right? Every ministry has a piece, practically speaking. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine a ministry that doesn't have a piece. Right? I'm sure you can name probably only one. Um, maybe sports. Maybe sports. Um, so who's in charge? Because if NRE is in charge and they make decisions that affects the territory of other ministries, are those decisions going to happen? Are they going to go ahead? Especially when energy is such a major factor in climate change. So basically you had two heads um, as far as the government approached this went. You had the energy ministry, Keta, and you had NRE. But then which head decides, I think this is like one of those old... Um, fairy stories. Which head decides which is the boss? Right? You've got a two-headed giant and which head is the boss? Can't decide, so they go to the other head, the third head, which is the Prime Minister. Okay? So the Prime Minister was interested in this around 2009-2010. So, okay, let's put a national climate change policy in place. Uh, fairly decently worded, actually. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister's attention began to go elsewhere after that some of the consequences of that now. And he was very consumed by elections, 2013, leading up to 2013. So the momentum on this and many other policies completely vanished. Right? I only went to one meeting of this, maybe two, one meeting. I went to one meeting of this, and after that, nothing. Um, and I don't even know whether there's been a meeting on this since. The other problem is, when I went for this meeting, there were three people in the ministry working on climate change. Uh, since then, one of them has gone into the diplomatic corps. Um, I think, is there only one left? Two left. I don't know. There's maybe two left, possibly only one, and you're going to get a lecture from one of them soon. Gary. But Gary is very good, but a very good person on their own is going to have their hands tied. Right? So there's not even much capacity at the ministry to get this issue ahead, let alone that ministry having the full authority to, go, to deal with it. So there's a bit of a challenge there. 
But then we we hit 2015, and along comes the 11th Malaysia Plan. Okay, so just in case you didn't miss it, there's a green chapter that deals with green issues, and it talks about a low carbon future. So if you're interested in the environment, if you're interested in climate change, you will go straight for this chapter and you read all the nice stuff in there. It'll tell you what they achieved in the 10th Malaysia Plan. Um, some climate mitigation, apparently, reducing Malaysia's carbon footprint. Some climate adaptation work. Uh, actually, I think there were quite a number of meetings on this, dealing with floods, the coastline, uh, which are quite important. Um, enhanced conservation of ecological resources. And then going ahead for the 11th Malaysia Plan, this is the plan that takes us from 2015 up till 2020. Five years. Sustainable production and consumption. This is an old issue that's been brought up to the UN for many, many years. It's good to see it moving ahead. Um, going for green growth. Conserving natural resources for present and future generations. Okay, good. Conservation, but not quite the same issue as climate change. Strengthening resilience against climate change and natural disasters. So dealing with the impacts, um, possibly dealing with the causes. So if you only read this green chapter, look okay, there's a lot to work towards here. Of course, the government lays up these issues. But if you flip the head to the next chapter, you'd find this. And you'd find that this is 2010 and this is 2015. This nice big red bar is coal. Okay? The amount of coal in our electricity mix. Uh, this is gas, hydro. Uh, this one here is renewable energy. Okay? And then that tiny little sliver is oil. Oil has shrunk and it has been shrinking for quite a while. But coal is going to grow up to 2020. So the plan that previously you saw the slide talks about green growth, talks about sustainable production and consumption, mitigating climate change, has plans to increase the amount of uh, fossil fuel greenhouse gas producing energy in our fuel mix. Okay? By quite a bit. By quite a bit. And this is the plan for renewable energy. Two to three percent. Coal is going to increase from 43 to 53%. Gas, which actually burns cleaner than coal, you didn't know, is going to reduce from 40 to 29%. That's because it's getting pricey, um, although that may change, I don't know. I haven't looked at gas prices since the, the oil price started plummeting, um, but the supply has also become limited. Malaysia had a lot of gas, but we kind of pre-sold most of it to Japan for the next 10 years at least. Okay, and hydro is only going to go slightly, um, although if Sarawak puts in 12 dams, maybe it'll grow more, but uh, there are not many consumers for that then, so it's not really going to displace uh, things like coal or gas. So this is the plan in the next chapter, after that nice chapter 6, uh, green chapter 6, you have the red uh, chapter 7, which talks about economy and energy and so forth. So this actually becomes a problem. There's also a bit of sneakiness here because there's one type of fuel that's not mentioned here in the chart, but is mentioned in the text, and that's nuclear. Okay, there's plans to bring in nuclear, and nuclear has had a very controversial history. It's also had a very contentious history as a climate change, uh, I wouldn't even call it a solution, as an energy offered as a solution for climate change, but there's a lot of debate about whether it is a solution. Uh, it's one of those solutions that may be worse than the cure. So, but there is support for nuclear because there's been a nuclear power corporation set up in the Prime Minister's Department. It's been given millions and millions of ringgit. Um, there are some common directors between the nuclear power corporation and some of the subsidiaries of 1MDB. And we know 1MDB is very interested in energy and power purchases along those lines. We know that the Prime Minister is personally interested in nuclear because one of his closest advisors, uh, the recently departed Jamaluddin Jarjis, was a big advocate of nuclear. His brother is also a nuclear scientist, so there's a lot of interest from that side, from that level, in nuclear power. And they've talked about spending at least 23 billion ringgit on a nuclear reactor. Well, two to four nuclear reactors. So that's something to consider as well. 
terms of national uh, issues. Um, my stance would be anti-nuclear, as you can probably tell. Um, I think there's a challenge to be faced in terms of climate change campaigning in Malaysia over the next five years because they're basically planning to try and start building a nuclear power plant after 2020. And one of the reasons they may bring to bear is to sell it as a climate change solution. Right? This is the argument that it's low in greenhouse gases, it's clean and so forth, it's cheap. Um, these are all the usual arguments used in nuclear. But of course, once you do the homework, you realize that um, it's a different kind of pollution. Greenhouse gases are effectively a pollution problem. Right? You have too much of one substance in the environment, and that causes chemical problems, physical problems, uh, ecological problems. Right? It's basically a pollution issue. You have too much cyanide in, in the environment, it's bad. You have too much uh, benzene, it's also bad. You have too many greenhouse gases, it's also a pollution problem. Nuclear power is not free of pollution. It's just that the pollution is not necessarily measured in terms of greenhouse gases. You've got radiation, you've got the uh, runoff waste from the mining. Uh, you also have the very, very uh, intractable problem of long-term and safe storage of waste. So people who work on climate change in Malaysia and elsewhere will probably have to deal with the nuclear issue. Coming up again and again, why don't you take this as a solution? Um, of course, there are some good arguments against that. I'm not going to get into that here. I think maybe you might deal with that in another session, or that's another discussion that can be had. But in the meantime, since I've mentioned nuclear as a challenge, let's look at the other challenges. So far, the stuff has been very technical. It's been about the government policy, at least. It's been quite technical. It's been about shifting production and consumption, quite abstract, shifting growth, quite abstract, shifting energy and fuel, quite abstract. There are also other climate issues, uh, one of which is climate justice, which you may or may not know about. If you haven't heard about it, climate justice basically marries a thread in existing environmental movements, which is called environmental justice. First, there was environmental issue, right? environmental campaigning. But there was a realization, or there was an argument that came forth that environment Environmental problems often happened where there was great social inequality or uh, issues of racism. So when you have social exclusion, you have marginalization and disempowerment. You also have groups of people or places that become dumping grounds, that become the sites of toxic waste, of toxic production, and there was sometimes a color to that whole outcome. So. This is a movement that came out of the United States, uh, also South Africa. Um, I think it's found a lot of traction in India as well. Uh, I was part of a group of NGOs that launched a climate justice movement many, many, many years ago. I think it was 2002 in Bali. Um, it's part of a broader movement and it involved a lot of indigenous activists, uh, a lot of actors from the global south. Uh, people who worked with poor communities, um, often non-white communities in the global north. So climate justice was a natural outgrowth of that. Um, it talked about similar issues, that there was a color line, so to speak, sometimes in environmental issues and climate change issues. Uh, you can see that in the big geopolitical picture of north and south. So that's one issue to think of here because some of those lines exist here as well, particularly with indigenous peoples, um, the is issues that they suffer, problems with land, uh, problems with some of the so-called solutions to climate change, especially with the building of dams, large dams. Um, and that is something to consider whether you're, often the climate movement may be too middle class, uh, too urban, what about people in rural areas? What about working class uh, people who have to deal with climate change or who may be suffering from climate change but don't necessarily have the resources to address it? These are kind of questions you may have to ask yourself. How will you mobilize? Um, how will you do outreach? Climate movement here is very small, right? I don't know if maybe movement is too aggressive, uh, too, too expansive a term. Um, but it's grown a lot, you know, we've gone from a few years ago where you wouldn't have a workshop like this to where we do have a workshop like this. And people like Adrian have been instrumental in building that up. And where do you start? We've already started, but where do we take the next step? So, you know, the task is tough, 
because you have to beat this. These are some, I don't know whether they're still alive, because this was taken when I was doing COP6 and COP9. These were the, these were the lawyers from the US oil industry, but they registered as a business entry. And these are, these are exactly the guys I would see every time I was at the negotiations. And they would sit immediately behind the Saudi delegation and whisper in their ear and give them all the <laughs> policy positions they would need to s hold back the climate negotiations. Because obviously the Saudi Arabian government is not interested in restricting the sale of fossil fuels. They want more to be sold and they don't want to adopt any kinds of national restrictions on that. And if other countries adopt national restrictions, their market goes down. So their friends in the US oil industry would sit behind them and give them all this friendly advice. Um, that's the NGO newspaper. They're not part of that. Just a coincidence. <laughs> yes. Um, so you have to beat people like this who have a lot of money and resources. And people like this locally <coughs> who also have a lot of involvement in the energy industry and auto industry and a lot of money and influence. And you don't even have this. Funny story, actually. I met, I met the person who created this. And she said that this character was actually based on my old boss from Malaysia, from 1992, the Earth Summit. So a lot of young activists there, and this lady who created it was quite inspired by it. So, you know, one day you two can become a cartoon. <laughs> 